Okay, so let's start with uh, so what is the, what is online machine learning? Okay, uh, it's gonna be a situation. So I'm gonna talk about the setup. So think of it as uh, something analog analogous to or you know is something similar to let's say supervised learning setup. Supervised learning setup, you have data x comma y n of them, and then you just want to learn a mapping between uh, x's to y's, right? So that was the setup for supervised learning. Here, there's going to be a specific setup, which is which is going to be a for loop. Or, or a loop, uh, which will say you optionally observe the state of the world, and the state of the world is essentially something like a feature. Okay, you observe a feature potentially, and here we're going to call it context. And so you make an observation. You may have some hardware, software, whatever. Given the observation, you should take an action. Maybe you kind of uh, uh, make a prediction. So your action can be as simple as saying, okay. The feature is, uh, is an image, I can classify it as a cat or something. But it can be more complicated, and that's why we are using this language. That I get a context, potentially, optionally, and then I respond with an action, okay? Uh, an action is essentially a decision. So we're gonna use the word action to say decision, okay? And then, uh, so once we take the action, we can potentially get a feedback. So we obtain a feedback on the chosen action. So this is it, this is it, this is online machine learning. So uh, all the, I guess, uh, interesting stuff is uh, how do I go from a, given a context, how do I go to an action, and how do I take feedback into account while taking better actions in the future? Okay, that's it. So, so that's the setup, okay? And what's the precise goal? We want to, uh, Optimize feedback. I mean, here we are directly saying optimize feedback. You can think of feedback as a way to say, you know, it's a it's a reward for you taking some action. Maybe, uh, maybe a call came and and you are taking an action service request in a call center, and you got a feedback, a rating, right? Uh, maybe you solved the customer's issue. Maybe you did not. And so you want to maximize the reward, as in you know the satisfaction of all the customers that you see over time, uh, uh, by choosing appropriate actions, right? And uh, so in this version of the problem, online machine learning, uh, we assume that the agent's action is not influenced by future context. Okay? So, sorry, agent's action does not influence future context. Okay? So I, I take a customer's call, maybe I don't solve their problem, the next customer who comes in, because I didn't solve the previous problem, has no influence on who comes in next. Maybe there is actually in real life, uh, you know, you do a really bad job or a sequence of customers, you know, you may lose customers. Um, but here we're just saying that uh, your current action has nothing to do with who comes next, okay? And so you get a fresh start every every round, okay? And we're gonna relax these things once we go to reinforcement learning. So right now it's a very canned setup where we are getting us we're getting multiple interactions with environment or the world, and world is telling me, okay, do something on this feature. Given the feature, and I take an action, I get a reward, okay? And uh, I need to learn how best to go from a potentially a feature to uh, an action over time, over, over these sequence of interactions. Okay. Uh, so so that's the, uh, that should be at the back of your mind as we go through today's lecture. Uh, but now I'm gonna just motivate uh, this example, uh, which, is, which I think I also discussed in the first lecture. But let me recap what this example is. So, so, so MSN has a page, I guess this is uh, bing.com or msn.com. Okay, so there's a, there's a web page and, and they want to actually uh, show personalized news to each user who comes to the website, okay? So, so this is the, it's like a Yahoo page or, or one of these older pages, I guess. Uh, it's one of these pages where, you know, somebody has to kind of decide what uh, what goes where in this in this page? It's like a newspaper page, right? Um, so that's that's the rough you know business level problem. You want to deploy, you want to have a website which is kind of personalized to each user, it shows personalized news, right? And so so what is the loop? So user arrives at MSN with uh, you know browsing history, user account. Maybe they have an account on Microsoft's website, right? Previous visits to the same website. Maybe they're, they're a frequent visitor, they keep visiting this page every day or every week. And so we choose, you know, 
we choose new stories that we want to display and uh, user response right with some um, response to the content shown for example through clicks navigation staying on the page for a long time or closing the page and stuff like that right and so you want to choose content so your goal is your actions are to choose content uh, to yield the user desired uh, you know desired user behavior so your actions are to choose content and uh, so again so just think of it this way right in supervised learning we're focused on this mapping you know learning something learning a parameter let's say in parametric supervised learning here it's not clear right here we are just saying directly jumping and saying we just need to sh make the right action so it's not clear what we are actually learning uh, but we'll get there okay uh, so y to yield a user desired behavior and uh, assumption is that recommendations to one user do not affect other users so maybe i make bad recommendations somebody closes the page next user comes in you know, they don't know i mean so they are not affected by me showing you know uh, incorrect suboptimal content to some let's say somebody is interested in sports but you only show something in music and then there's in, there's incompatibility right things like that uh, don't affect the future okay so so pictorially you know again the same point uh, is that you know there's there's going to be user maybe it's uh, some demographic features uh, some history of how they interacted with the website in the past and uh, maybe also features of uh, articles uh, there are potentially 50 articles that you can show on this page. Out of 50, you may only want to show, you only have space to show, let's say, 5 or 10 or something like that. Uh, then this block comes in, which is what we'll study today. Uh, and it creates, so in this case, the action is actually not just, you know, whether to show an article or not, but given the 50 articles, actually give me a ranking of these 50 articles. Okay. Um, and then, okay, you sh maybe... Maybe it's an inference crawl type of an app, single web, single web app or whatever, single page app, SPA. Uh, and so you keep scrolling, you can get to all the 50, maybe. And then, you know, on the client side, the client side, you know, you maybe click on clicking on a story, or they spend a lot of time on the story, and 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 the website logs it as well. Okay. Um, in particular, in this example, actually, this was deployed. So. Uh, we, and it did use some online machine learning uh, technique. Uh, so in this example, you know, just to kind of show you what the impact is. Uh, so what is the baseline? Baseline would be any a, a non-machine learning based, uh, um, sorry, non-online machine learning based technique where you would kind of, you know, maybe have a, have this data from history historical usage. From this, you may directly create a supervised classifier which will say okay given this input tell me what exactly is going to be the uh, rank list let's say a ranking problem uh, and then keep keep using that model uh, to generate that rank list right um, but you will see that uh, by using this feedback so that would be a model but then uh, you can think of it this way right you will have to retrain the model every with every, after every interaction with the user if you want to include new data Right. Um, so I don't know if you got my point. So you can always create XIYIs, where XI would be the features of the user, history of the user, all that stuff, uh, features of the articles, and create YIs. YIs could be as structured as list of ranks. Right. Uh, we haven't seen that version in in, uh, in most of our course ma materials, but there is a ranking version of uh, supervised learning as well. Okay. So you can create rank lists. Uh, so you can create a mapping f of theta, let's say. But you need to kind of update, potentially update this f of theta every time you interact with the user. And uh, you see there are thousands of requests per second. Um, so you can't really update such a model thousands of times. Maybe maybe you are willing to not update the model for thousands of seconds. So uh, batch learning doesn't, or supervised learning, or batch supervised learning to be more precise, uh, doesn't, doesn't work. Is not at the uh, at least not at this this uh, frequent uh, interaction with the users, right? Where you want to quickly take feedback into account and improve. Um, and so the online machine learning solution that they use, uh, they kind of have deployed on MSN.com. Uh, it kind of adds some overhead because there's going to be some something intelligent going on now, uh, and there's some stats about how to update models. I mean, we haven't seen any model yet, so let's. Uh, defer it for later, and and they observe some relative gains. They don't show absolute numbers, of course. So, uh, so they show that with this online machine learning block, uh, they're able to increase uh, 
you know, maybe one of their rewards is uh, number of clicks on the articles on the page. Okay, and they see some some average of 25 percent increase in clicks uh, for a short period of time. Actually, I think this is December of 2015. Or something. Uh, you can find more details in this in this research article. Um, so it's only a period of I think 20, 20 days. So they show that uh, with this new system, they can really increase, you know, get 25 percent increase, and that's a lot for such a portal. Okay. So, any questions about the context the application release? Yeah. What is why is so why is in this case was the sequence of uh, articles, right? Like a uh, ordered list of articles. So if you come in, maybe you're a sports fan, then uh, sports articles should be ranked higher than let's say music or something else. Politics or something like that. New users, uh, new user who doesn't have any context. So they will have some feature vector. Maybe their accounts are all zero, let's say. There may be feature which says whether the user is new or not. There may be a map. So if the user is new, you know, these types of cold start problems, you can always uh, have some default rule. Okay. I mean, the default rule need not be even. Uh, just uh, knowledge base. It can also be based on previous new users. How did they behave? <laughs> Things like that. Okay. So and so, this application is not specific, right? I mean, there are many other applications. Like uh, mostly, I'm talking about web-related applications, like. Content recommendation, personalization of search results, anything to do with personalization. Right? Um, and customer churn is a very general topic. Uh, it just means you know, your customers in your SaaS product or something are leaving, uh, unsubscribing potentially. Uh, so anything to do with, to do with personalization requires uh, mm -hmm. updating your model, somehow taking better decisions on your end so that the customer sticks. Right? Uh, and we'll see that. Uh, so, so, so today's lecture is going to be how to figure that out, how to personalize, as in how to learn something about the other side. You know, They react by telling, giving you a reward, that they stick on the page, or they leave the page, or they do something, right? You'll get a reward. And so you kind of seeing a sequence of rewards that you got, uh, better yourself. Okay. Um, there's going to be some randomness. That's why there's a die. Um, OK. So. So let's get to uh, the first part. So today, so as I said, there's going to be A-B testing. And there's going to be some bandit problems. And bandit problems will have a, you know, like two, three algorithms. So you know, they're all applicable to the same problem. So but we look at two, three different algorithms. Um, within bandit problems, we said you know, there's something called multi on bandits. And there's something called contextual bandits. Contextual. I guess multi arm bandits. Yeah. So this is roughly the set of problems that we look at, not the solutions. Um, I guess A/B testing is a solution potentially. So let's see. Um, so again, motivation for A/B testing. So A/B testing has been covered in any lecture or any place before. His hypothesis testing covered in any any lecture before. Okay. So A/B testing is nothing but two sample hypothesis testing. Uh, so that's what it is. It's just a new term, or not new term, but it's been there. It's just the uh, same thing. Okay. Um, how many of you have never heard of A/B testing? Okay. Heard of the term, but you don't know what exactly it entails. You know what exactly? Yeah. So hypothesis testing. Yeah. I mean. Uh, so today, let's see what what the context is. So. So typical business scenario. I mean. You know, this is a scenario. Let's say you know the company is making a product. Uh, there's a meeting to decide on how to improve the product, or maybe you know there's a service, right? Uh, and there are multiple competing ideas. You know, different managers have different ideas uh, uh, of how the service can be improved or how the product can be improved. And you want to make this decision after making some field observation. So this is uh, kind of important. So you are not taking you want you don't want to take a decision beforehand of which idea is better and roll with it. You want to actually uh, do some field, you know, field observation just means try out both. So if you have the energy and the resources to actually build both enhancements, try out both and then kind of 
really run it you know on the you know in the while figure out which one is more uh, which one is better for example right um so so you'll make field observations as in you will kind of see what is the response of the users to that product or the service enhancement uh, but then how do you pick uh, one of them okay so so it this must be you know getting uh, this must make it clear to you that yeah we're going to collect samples of two different um treatments or two different settings and then uh, from those samples kind of get a average performance of each enhancement and then just compare those two and so that kind of should remind you of two sample hypothesis testing so whether one is bigger than the other or equal of both things are equal and so on okay um so let's see and and just to further motivate their companies like optimizely is the one of the bigger ones uh th and maybe you know companies like optimize apt and so on uh, which actually give this type of uh, solution uh, you know the saas companies so this these types of solutions for many websites so m many m you know the most recurring websites that you kind of visit may al already have these javascript you know third party javascript which are kind of actually actively testing on you so whether you like it or not the moment you use internet you are uh, subject in an ab test okay most of the time um uh, so so in fact i think uh, so, so some guy, some people at microsoft um uh, you know for bing.com at least uh they have actually very extensively documented their their experience doing ap tests at scale so uh, microsoft at the microsoft scale they really do thousands of ap tests and i don't and they're all for trying to get e e out very little performance enhancements to you know their product which is bing you know it's a search engine um and of course all these big companies do it and there are huge set of companies which also do it potentially using third party uh companies okay uh and ab testing is not just limited to in internet companies uh it's also related to uh clinical trials okay so where you want to kind of say whether drug a is better than drug b or drug a is better than a control or a placebo and so on um So let's start with a you know simple example. So there are two you know there are two pages. Let's say this is a small company, uh, and uh, so some you know the team wanted to decide whether to have a page like A or a page like B, and the only difference is B has a has this uh, coupon code, enter coupon code. Okay. Uh, so which page do you think has a higher conversion rate? It just means you know people kind of complete the transaction and pay you money. Okay, I can't hear. So let's say who goes for A, just one. So everybody else, okay, four. Everybody else for B. B has higher conversion rate. Okay. Uh, so with B, actually, uh, this, this part in this instance, okay, it's not a general rule, but in this instance, they lost a lot of revenue because we call the coupon code. People actually open another tab and kind of Google, tr trying to kind of find the coupon, and sometimes they won't find coupon, and then okay, maybe this is not an immediate purchase. Let me investigate it further. and so they kind of you know the the funnel gets affected so this is a very you know expensive way to figure out which product is <laughs> which which enhancement is better okay if you're really losing money and so that's why many companies um you know this is a very kind of a very important aspect to many companies bottom line you know they if they lose the revenue for a week or uh, or 10 days they may be may, they may be in the red okay um okay So, so just coming back to the online machine learning setup, uh, we're going to ignore one important aspect, which is going to be the online aspect. Okay. So, so we are not going to kind of take into account instantaneous fee instantaneous feedback, and our action is just going to be whether to have the product enhancement or not, or you know, if you have multiple enhancement, which product enhancement uh, we should have. Okay. Which one of the you know few options that we should actually uh, deploy. Okay. That's going to be the action or the decision. and uh, you're going to ignore instantaneous feedback isn't you going to collect much you know a lot of feedback uh, and then figure out uh, and and then take a decision okay so we'll only use feedbacks at the end of the period um for example they can be used to decide on um you know recommendation policies for example uh, if it's uh, if it's the msn setting um, and so on okay so just coming back So we're testing about showing two solutions. Yeah. 
in the most vanilla case you have two solutions and figuring out if solution a is different from solution b okay yeah uh, the motivation is hypothesizing you need to collect samples to figure out whether one is better than the other so you decide a period okay uh, this yeah yeah, yeah, you can decide the period. And so, if, I don't know if you, so how many of you are not familiar with hypothesis testing at all? Two, just two? Okay, so hypothesis testing has, uh, I don't know if you recall, but hypothesis testing has this uh, relation between sample size, power of the test, and uh, type one error, which is the accept reject, uh, you know, threshold, right? So if you have less, use it to choose how many samples you wanna collect. That's going to influence the power of the test. Power of the test just means uh, it's one minus the type two error, which basically just means whether you can detect a, you know, performance improvement. If there is, if there was actually a performance improvement, can you detect it? Okay. Uh, let's not go into that terminology because there's a lot of uh, you know specific names for them, and we are not looking at that specifically here. Um, actually, I'll discuss a little bit about that. So, so in the vanilla case let's call A control and B uh, treatment. Um, the most important thing is to randomly split the users who are coming to your website or who are using your product uh, while showing uh, solution A or while showing solution B, okay? And, uh, and collect the outcomes and decide uh, which option is better. And, uh, this is actually is same thing as same as doing what is called randomized control trial. Yeah. So, so it's a little bit different than hypothesis. In hypothesis testing, you've been you know somebody gives you data. I mean, so that's where the story starts. So here we are actually saying. When a user comes to your website, which version do you want to show? You randomly, you have to randomly put the user in one bucket or the other. Uh, you know, show version A or version B. That's very important here. Um, and that's the only. So that's the beginning of the story for this part. I mean, instead of directly getting observational data and talking about hypothesis uh, which is probably how you've probably seen it before. Here we are saying you actually run this experiment and collect data, and then you do the hypothesis thing. Okay. So that's it. And uh, and why do we care about random assignment? Because it eliminates uh, bias and uh, confounding. Okay. So you should not uh, decide which solution to show to which solution to show to which user based on the user characteristics. Basically, you wanna kind of not relate. Um, uh, so, for example, if you know that your user is uh, a really you know. Uh, maybe a college professional, college student versus a uh, uh, working professional. You should not base your decision of which version to show based on that. Okay, uh, that's what we are saying. Um, and and so this is very critical actually. So this will actually give you ensure that it's basically the intuition is if you do that, if you randomly assign incoming population to you know show show either the control or the treatment, uh, then you know on average uh, it's the population or the people who see the control, their their statistical properties are going to be the same as the population. Uh, sorry, the set of people who see the treatment. Okay, their statistical properties are going to be the same. Okay. Um, for example, if e each group has a true mean effect, so there's some true response, a true like conversion rate, mu one, let's say, if if the website on the left was shown, and if there was a true conversion rate, mu two. Uh, when, the left, when the website on the right side was shown and from data you want to infer whether these are different, uh, whether they're the same and which one is larger. These are the types of questions you can answer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean whatever level, I mean you should not uh, I'm not saying you should you should not see the profile. I mean, given the profile, I'm saying don't make your decisions about which function to show based on the profile. That's all. Yeah, per per profile type, you can always do A/B testing. That's fine. Um, okay. 
and so that comes back to so given two samples you want to say you want to you want to answer these questions right you did this randomized control trial essentially you collected the data and this is what companies do okay. this is what optimizely helps companies do okay and then you collect information and then you figure out whether this version of the site is better than that version or this feature is useful for um, the user's productivity or not and so on those those are the types of questions you can answer and to do so, uh, once you get this data, you basically do hypothesis tests, and there are slightly different versions um, based on this ideology. Um, I think the most sim most familiar one is probably Fisher's test, Fisher type of test, <coughs> where you have a null hypothesis, and you want to figure out whether the test statistic is test statistic or worse version of it is unlikely given the null hypothesis, and then you potentially reject the null hypothesis or not reject the null hypothesis, okay? So, so what I'm saying is, given the observation, given the data, right, uh, you create a test statistic, let's call it Z, okay? Uh, or let's call it Z hat, just to say that this is a function of the data. Given data, you just created this, this function. This, you know, under the null, under the null, okay? not this, but under the null, uh, any z, under the null there is a particular distribution, okay, Pro probably distribution of z, okay. Under the null there is some distribution of uh, this, this, this function of data, but you observed a specific number because you had the realization of the data, right. All you're asking is whether the probability of this z hat um, is, uh, so all you're asking is what is the probability of z hat actually under null, under null. And uh, actually, so this is not the right way to write. So probability of, so let me actually make this uh, capital Z. So you're just asking what, what is the probability of capital Z, for example, uh, being greater than or equal to Z hat. So if you think of, uh, let's say this probability of Z is actually a normal, normal distribution, okay? Probability of Z is normal distribution. So this Z is random variable. So forget about the z hat. Z, this is some number I computed from data. Let's keep it aside. There's some probability of z, okay? There's a random variable. Maybe it's normal. You're just asking whether z is greater than z hat given null. Okay. So maybe you. So maybe maybe z hat is over here, the observed thing. And you're asking what is the probability mass on that thing on the on the right side of this. Depends on the specific test. I'm just giving you an example uh, illustration of what it, what the test essentially does in, in the picture version of the problem. It just says, what is the probability mass over here? Okay. And if this number is really, really low, okay. I mean, in fact, this number is actually the p-value. So this actually evaluates to one number, right? This is a, like a negative CDF. This evaluates to one number. That number is the p-value. And you're just checking whether this number is, this probability mass is, greater than some threshold or smaller than some threshold. If it is greater than some threshold, then you don't reject the null. If it's smaller than some threshold, you reject the null. That's one type of a rule. Okay. You can always compare with the threshold and do something. So so that's that threshold is called the alpha level of the test. And if this number, this mass is smaller than the alpha level, you reject the null. That it's unlikely that uh, the null is true, given that I observed a rare value, you know, Given that I observed a rare value, you know, rare value of of my derived function of my data. Okay, that's all. And uh, in the Nave and Pearson uh, way of doing things, you don't really do that. You kind of look at probability of data or functions of data. It can be, you know, you may observe hundred different hundred observations for some function of the data. How likely is that probability? Compared to how likely is that that sorry how likely is that data under null versus uh, how likely is the data under some alternate hypothesis? Okay, maybe if this ratio this is like the likelihood of the data under some some hypothesis null hypothesis and this is the likelihood of the data under some other hypothesis. Maybe you say this is data is normal with mean mu one and data is normal with mean mu sorry mu one mu two let's say. Maybe this you know with mean mu one maybe this likelihood is higher. Than this one, okay. Then you kind of have a relative ratio of whether, and like you know, this will give you some number, 
and then you compare that number with another threshold and see whether you want to prefer the null or the alternator okay that's that's neiman hepel neiman pearson way of doing things and the base inversion is to do the same ratio but also add in priors okay so base in this means you know kind of use uh, priors because this is just a ratio of likelihoods ideally want a ratio of uh, posterior probability of the null being true given data and the posterior probability of uh, alternative given true being true given the data so you just get, uh, so you know how to go from here to here because if you can add prior prior distributions probability of h0 and probability of h1 you can go from here to here by base rule okay so that's roughly you know just a very high level what are the three different ways of thinking about hypothesis this any questions at this point and uh, so so we won't spend too much time on ab testing that's what so that's that's ab testing that i'm going to cover uh, it's very intuitive to set up and uh, very intuitive to conclude so as least the fisher way you can either reject or not reject the null right null could be the the current website so you have a uh, you have an enhancement and you are just asking whether i should uh, reject the whether the enhancement is effective enough that i can reject the null okay so not current website current performance level current uh, whatever conversion rate for example um so field experiment essentially decides uh, you know the actions that you take uh, rather than you know gut instinct uh, it's used in the industry quite a bit actually maybe 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 more maybe less compared to binary techniques but we'll see um it's also called split testing or bucket testing and uh, and it need not be a one time process actually people run multiple hypothesis tests so multiple ab tests or you can even not have just two options but 10 options or 100 different options if you have 100 options then you are basically chunking your visitors to your website for example into 100 different uh, buckets and in each bucket you are showing a different variation okay people do that and people will pay a lot of money to do that uh, uh, and especially when you do multiple hypothesis tests there are other issues that creep up which is like uh, uh, you know so the interpretation of p value is that uh, if p value is 0.05 uh, it just means that with 1 uh, out of 20 times you may get a, you may not be able to reject the null essentially okay so those types of uh, rejection issues can get compounded if you are doing multiple hypotheses so there is some something that you need to do more there um, just giving you an idea of why this is although it seems seems simple the vanilla version why is why are companies uh, working so hard on it because this is, uh, this is uh, this has extensions which are more complex and interesting problem okay um yeah so another issue i guess which actually why companies spend a lot of effort on this is because uh after you've already like let's say you've enhanced the product once you know you saw ab test you could reject the null or could see an impact of uh, your enhancement after that you again added some enhancement now this is the null over which you are trying to do better after some time to eke out that additional uh, performance by a new feature is going to be potentially difficult right the new effect after you have you have done let's say taken 100 decisions 100 enhancements of your website how much more can you improve the conversion rate right maybe very little so detect to detect that small effect maybe you need to have large sample size that depends on the power of the test okay uh, so there are such issues and there are, there's it's documented for at least for uh bing.com in on this website by th their team and uh and so given this con uh i'm not just this con but in general that the con that is not online uh leads us to kind of look at other strong side different way so we know what we wanted to actually do is let's say we started the test with two treatment and control or two uh, two potential you know enhancements we see the first five users on each side maybe it's very evident that uh, one enhancement is way worse than the other one then you should not be wasting you know another 100 impressions or 100 interactions the user just to get the best uh, you know uh, just to get a more accurate uh, mu1 hat or mu2 hat right so uh, so you want to kind of respond dynamically as each user interacts with the uh, interacts with uh, uh, your your action or you know enhancement Uh, and gives you a reward of you know how did they like it or not okay so after each user interaction you should probably figure out 
which one to show more okay so it's like a dynamic version of instead of showing 100 users 100 sequential users one version and then again 100 users uh, another version not that in that way but randomized uh, you can potentially at the end of the day show 10 users one version and uh, you know 190 users other version if the second version is actually better so you are able to incur lesser losses okay that's roughly the idea um, so that's what I mean here and and you can also uh, you know so that's the version where there's so in A-B testing there's no context uh, based uh, decision making so here uh, in Banish there's going to be I mean in Banish also there's one version of Banish problems there's no context based decision making and the final version that we'll see has some something to do with context user profiles okay uh, so that's A-B testing. Any questions just to A-B testing? Yeah. So uh, when you mentioned that we, uh, we are looking at one aspect of the website, one aspect of the website, so if I want to look at multiple aspects of the website, uh, what is the best way to do it? Yeah. I mean, I have to do it in isolation, but if I want to see and the collaborative of the website, I can say I'm looking at something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It could be a possibility that it's that. Yeah. So you'll have to test that. Any enhancement, anything that you're saying, it could be combinatorial in nature. That a subset of enhancements that you did uh, ultimately lead to higher conversion rate compared to some other subset. So you may have too many uh, potential uh, treatments. So your A-B test may have too many, so it's called A-B-N test, uh, where you may have too many treatments. So you have to account for that. There is no simple way to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can always repeat a test. I mean, the thing is, the nature of at least online testing is that uh, the outcomes are so unlike clinical trials, unlike uh, other domains, online tests may not be even reproducible. Okay, these are so uh, the underlying uh, nature of the environment is so dynamic or changing that the test impact may not be true further down the line, you can retest things, yeah. So it's really a more uh, production focused uh, approach than, you know, very grounded in statistics and, I mean, it is grounded in statistics, but, uh, uh, so all the concerns that you're raising, uh, there are solutions to that. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so let's see. So let's get let's get to bandit problems and uh, so so why the name bandit? Okay, so let's just disambiguate uh, that. Uh, this this guy is you know a slot machine is called a bandit. Okay, it's called a one arm bandit because you have one arm that you can pull, right? And uh, maybe you'll make money or you lose money, right? Uh, and so multi arm band just means you have multiple slot machines. Okay, so it's it's the analogy is that each arm that you're pulling is essentially an action that you're taking. It's like an action that you're taking. Uh, they're all you know there are let's say k slot machines in front of you. Which slot machine would you pick uh, to take an action? So that's going to be your uh, your decision, your action to take among k choices, right? Um, and it's called pulling an arm. Pulling an arm because you know in in, in a slot machine you pull an arm and uh, once you take that action, okay, you pull an arm, you get a reward, okay, you get a reward, which is a measure of success, which is a user click, you know, click through rate, or not rate, but cl uh, click itself, um, or some purchase or something, subsequently, and so on. So that's the uh, reward. So you take an action, you get a reward, okay. So that's the setup, okay. And so in general, there are going to be K arms. Okay, we're going to assume that each arm corresponds to an unknown distribution mu k. Okay, so what is meant by distribution? So there is in this picture each one. So maybe this is an arm which is Bernoulli with probability 0 0.01. Okay, in the sense if you pull this arm, maybe it flips a coin and with uh, one tenth probability it will give you one dollar and with uh, Nine ten probably will consume your dollar. Okay, so and maybe this arm has is also has a distribution, maybe Bernoulli with po probably point two. Okay, that's what I mean by each arm being associated, each action being associated with some stochastic reward. 
so the reward is not deterministic okay it's going to be a random thing but there's going to be an average of that maybe maybe if it's a bernoulli the average of that is going to be the parameter okay i mean this value is being bounded between 0 to 1 of the reward is not necessary it's just uh, ignore that so each, each time t uh, v you know uh, so what what are we supposed to design we are supposed to design a software an algorithm or an agent you know that pulls these arms you know takes actions autom in an automated way and what does it get to see it gets to see re it gets to see feedback after every time after every pull that it makes it's going to pull an arm as in take an action out of one of these k choices and it observes a reward which is uh, xt which is a realization from one of the from the arm that it pulled so i sub t in this index is 1 to k and so mu sub i sub t is going to be the distribution of the arm that you pull. From the distribution, I'm going to get observe a reward x t. Okay. And uh, if you're going to assume that these are i i d, so that's what I mean, meant by no relation between one interaction and the second interaction. So in one interaction, you tried an arm. In the next interaction, you tried the same arm. Even those rewards are not correlated at all. Forget about correlation, they're, not, they're independent. In the sense, no moments are um, everything. You know, the joint distribution kind of factorizes. Okay, and what is the objective? The objective is going to be to maximize the expected sum of rewards. So, why is there an expectation? Because the rewards are random. Okay, there could also be an expectation because your strategy, the, the software that you design, may also be random. Okay, which means that you, on your side, flip a k-sided coin, and then decide one of the actions. You could potentially do that. You know, I haven't designed. I haven't told you what is the design of a uh, agent yet. Okay, uh, but if the agent also randomizes, then you need to take uh, expectation over the agent's randomness as well. But anyway, for simplicity, less. You know, since there is uh, these distributions, there has to be an expectation. You know, at the minimum. In this setting, okay. So let's say the mean of mean of each arm is mu k, and the mean of the best arm is uh, mu star k, mu star. It just means that you know. So these are the this is the mean reward you, you would collect if you keep playing the same action every you know if you keep doing the same thing over sequence of interaction. And mu star is the uh, mean reward that you collect if you knew which of the arms had the highest mean mean uh, mean highest mean reward, and you kind of kind of keep using the same that that particular arm. Okay, as in taking the same action. So that's the setting. Any questions at this point? Okay. So it is an online problem because you know I need to take it, which are these actions, and I can use what I saw from before. So maybe when taking a, taking the taking the action it, I can see what happened in uh, all my x. You know what were the rewards I got or the t minus 1 rounds that happened before me okay right um, so we need to come up with some algorithm which uh, some algorithm and some strategy which kind of tries these arms okay we don't want to so what is the what's the what's the strategy so you can think of it this way right i have k arms so maybe for the first uh, 50 users i keep showing the first decision or first arm pull the first arm for 50 rounds, I pull the second arm. For 50 rounds, I pull the third arm. For 50 rounds, I pull the fourth arm. You know, after k times, uh, you know, whatever, 50 times k, I will be done. And then I'll have some ex some values of ob observations of rewards that I got. I can take that average, and I, then I can compare which arm probably is the best one, right? Which one has the highest mean reward, and then go from there. That could be one strategy, right? Um, or I can I can say okay I'm gonna ignore I'm gonna start with some arm and keep pulling that that's a very bad strategy, um, and the strategy that I just described is the round, round round robin strategy where you know you split if you have hundred tries that you can potentially do in this experimentation uh, uh, phase then you can try fifty for the first arm fifty for the second arm and so on okay that's what I just mean round robin I mean you can spend fifty first on just the first arm or you can do first each one in sequence, each one again in sequence, each one again in sequence and so on. It's the same thing. Okay. And and so over n little n number of rounds you'll collect some reward. Right? Total uh, total reward is gonna be uh, sum over 
1 to n of xt. xt is the each, you know, reward dollar amount that I'm getting every round, right? Every interaction, with the, sorry, every arm that I pull, right? Every decision that I make. Think of those decisions as your websites, okay? You have, let's say, k websites. You're showing my website, a user comes, and the and user maybe clicks on something or doesn't click on something, that's your reward. Okay. So that's it. So these are whether they clicked or not, some counts of whether they clicked or not. And which which website you showed is not kind of it's not hit it's not here because which website you showed is SMP ID. Okay. Capital ID. If you knew if you knew that there was one particular version of the website which is the best one, which was, you know, IT star or something. Uh, one of these indices, right? Uh, one of the k indices, one to k. Maybe there's one, one website which was the best one. Then the the reward for that is mu star. And so in n rounds, you could potentially have collected an expectation. You could have collected n times mu star as a reward in expectation. Right? But you only collected rewards in this particular, you know, uh, trial that you did. You have collected a reward which is this, right? So. So, uh, of course, here, uh, yeah, so this, this is called regret. Cumulative regret just means I'm just adding over all the rounds that I interacted with the users, interact with the environment in this case, world. Uh, that's why it's called cumulative. And regret just means this is the best I could have done, and this is what I actually did. So this is between what I could have done. If I, in hindsight, if I knew the true distributions of these, each of the arms, of, of the rewards of each of the arms, then I could have computed new star and I could have just played that arm. This is the this is the expected reward I would have got in end round. But this is what I got. So my regret is just gonna be this minus this. That's the definition of regret. And the goal is to find a strategy, something like round robin strategy or something else, uh, which which will give me small expected cumulative regret. Uh, what is this expectation over? This expectation is because XT is random. This XT. For a particular sequence of things that you did, you will get little XT. But, um, but these are random variables, right? So that's why there's an XT. That's, that's just a minor detail, yeah? I mean, you have K choices. Constant just means pick one and keep playing that. Right, I mean. I mean, maybe it's a very bad way of explaining it. Uh, I meant constant strategy as like if you have three choices, pick one of the choices. Maybe with some luck you would pick this one. Maybe with some luck you pick this one and then keep playing that. So if you keep playing this, the best one let's say is point two. Maybe this is zero reward. Okay, this one, this is the best one. Best decision that best website you always show. You wouldn't know that beforehand. If you knew that beforehand, you would always show this one. But because you don't know, you have to try out them. And that's the whole point of A/B testing, right? A/B testing would say. Spend 50 rounds on this one, 50 rounds of interaction with this one, 50 rounds of interaction with this one, then get pre estimates, and then see which one is the best one okay, through hypothesis testing. Here we are saying, uh, uh, here we are saying how to come with a better strategy than that to minimize uh, what is called regret. So it's a, um, so regret notion is trying to capture the idea that if you're doing bad, uh, in each round there's a reward. Okay. Uh, and if you're doing bad, you should change your strategy of which uh, action, which, uh, where you will direct your user to, so as to maximize your, so, so as to maximize your rewards and minimize your regret. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you're not, if you're worried about regret, don't reward it because it's any constant, okay? You can just think of it as maximizing cumulative reward. Uh, this is a term which is used in, uh, in the literature in this industry, that's why I'm using that. But it's the same thing as uh, maximizing rewards. Musta is the mean of that arm. So each arm corresponds has a corresponding distribution, like Bernoulli point one, Bernoulli point two. So Musta is the mean of that distribution. You don't know this. So yeah, I mean you don't know this, and still you know how to minimize regret. You don't know this number. Yeah. I mean, you don't know any of the distributions, any any of the parameters of the distribution. If you knew that, then the problem is very straightforward. Now, the key difference is, uh, if you think of this picture, 
A B testing would say 50 users on this side, 50 users on this side. In between, I'm not going to do any decisions. I mean, the decisions is already predetermined. Uh, 50 users will exactly see this. 50 users will exactly see this. See this a priori. You haven't seen the rewards at all. Then after those uh, 50, 50, 100 rounds, then you'll have some status test statistic, and you can accept and reject the hypothesis. Okay. Here, after every time a user sees something, you can take that reward XT into account, XTT into account, to take, figure out where, what the next user should see. So it's dynamic in that way. Okay. Ultimately, the effect consequence is going to be that maybe you know this is actually Bernoulli point two and Bernoulli point one. The algorithm should be such that it will not spend fifty. It will not send fifty users here. It should probably sp maybe it will only send twenty five users here and maybe seventy five users here because there is a cost, you know. Because if it sends seventy five users here, it will have more cumulative reward. Okay. Let's see. After that, intuitive idea. Okay. This, by the way, disclaimer. This whole course is mostly intuitive. You will see that uh, there's going to be any topic you pick. There's going to be depth and more rigorous uh, treatment of all these topics. Okay. Um. Okay. So let's see. Let's first algorithm um, to which is which kind of uh, tries to do better uh, than round robin strategy is this. It's called epsilon greedy. Okay. It's a strategy. So what is the what is the, what does the strategy do? It has to see a b sequence of rewards, and then uh, at every round it has to decide on what what arm to pick, right? Out of the three arms, let's say, let's keep the mental picture of those three uh, slot machines. And uh, the strategy is going to be, I mean, uh, is going to be here, you know, at each time t, it's going to be a randomized strategy. Randomized just means it's going to flip some coins. Uh, algorithm is going to flip some coins as well on this on our side. Okay, to hallucinate basically. With probability one minus epsilon, it'll pick the arm which is the best so far. So what is the what is meant by arm which is best so far? Let's say we have we have uh, already interacted with already interacted with let's say three users. In our case, there were three. Um, so k is equal to three. Let's say uh, we had three slot machines, three versions of the website. We sent one user here, one sent one user here, one user one user here, which means that we got some reward x one, some reward x two, some reward x three. So one, two, three do doesn't just means the, the three. Um, so let's say let's call it x one one, x two one, and x three one. So so the first index represents the first uh, website. Let's say website one, website uh, one, website two, website three. Okay, x one one just says that this is the first user who went to the first website, this is the first user who went to the second website, first user went to the third website, and they did something. These are the rewards. Maybe they clicked, then they not so maybe maybe x11 is 0, x21 is 0, x31 is 1. Okay, that means at this point, this is the best subject is the best uh, best thing to do. You know, best website to show for any future guy. Okay, so that's what I mean by subject is the best. Um, it just means that at any given point of time, maybe you have shown the first website to few people, second website to a few people, third website to a few people. Then you can just take the average reward that you got. Over the few people that you actually showed the first and second and third website, okay. So there's going to be some some averages, you know, some averages that you maintain. Whichever average is the highest, that's your subject with the best arm so far, right? I mean, you saw some averages. The average is the highest, probably is the best arm for you so far. But you only pick that website to show to the next user with one minus epsilon probability. You pick that website with one minus epsilon probability, and you pick a, a random website with epsilon by k probability. This is essentially an algorithm. Okay. Basically, saying I've seen that one of the websites seems to be really doing well, then that's the website I'm gonna kind of show to the next user adaptively. So, see that this decision is based on data, based on it's dynamically based on whatever you have experienced so far. Okay, that's that's the so you're not waiting to collect samples and then do something. So you pick the website that you think is the best so far. It has the highest average reward so far with some probability. And then with some other probability, you kind of randomly pick a website. Okay. That's the algorithm. And this scientist versus businessman is just a, uh, you know. The point of view is that, you know, scientist view is essentially explore new ideas. Try different things. 
that was the second part of that algorithm. And first part is saying describe the best idea so far and best website so far. Let's see if this one And why do we need this? Is because you don't know, you precisely don't know what the mean rewards are for each of the arm that you pull. Okay? You don't know the mean rewards. If you knew the mean rewards, mu1, mu2, mu3, mu k, or mu1, mu2, mu3 in this case, example, then you would pick the one with the highest mu value. Mu is the true mean reward which is a function of their, their arm distribution, right? Because you don't know that, you need to explore, as in you need to try different arms to get a better better estimate of these uh, reward values that, that you can estimate. Right. So, so epsilon greedy is just precisely that. Greedy just means whatever information I know so far, I'll take the best option or best action using that. Okay, that's what greedy means. And epsilon just means that uh, you know, with some epsilon probability, I will not be greedy. I'll just explore arbitrarily. Okay. So, so that's the first algorithm. Is that uh, intuitively clear? It's not clear whether it's going to do better than other things, but is the algorithm clear? It's data dependent, right? It's looking at the sequence of rewards that you've obtained so far and taking the next decision of which website version to show to the user. Okay. Any questions? And so uh, here's a plot. Uh, there are five arms. Okay. So. So these are the true uh, reward probabilities. Let's say these are Bernoulli arms. So point one, point one, point one, point one, point nine. So there is one of these slot machines which really has a high mean reward. So if you knew that, then you would always pull this particular slot machine. But you don't know that. So you have to start from not knowing anything. And over a sequence of interactions with the user, you need to see uh, you need to see how how you're doing. In the sense, you need to start from the beginning of time, and then you have no you have a you don't know which arm is the best. Uh, you do epsilon greedy, right? In this, uh, yeah. I mean, so then this plot actually is showing five different, five different configurations. One, two, I guess, yeah, five different configurations of different epsilons. Okay, so let's fix one, one epsilon. So let's say epsilon is point one. Okay. It just means that uh, for this curve, it's showing uh, how often do you select the best arm? How often are you sh selecting the point nine arm over time? In a sense, let's say it, it, this in 50 rounds, if you if you if it shows that you're only selecting this uh, the point nine guy, um, something like 60 percent of the time, that means that you are you can potentially select the other guys 40 percent of the time. The other guys are these guys 40 percent of the time. But but the probability with which you're selecting the best arm increases very high. Uh, you know, as as you have more and more user interactions. It's not gonna go to one because there's always this epsilon probability with which you'll try some other arm. So you'll never always pick the best arm. Okay. Is the I mean this experiment showing the sensitivity sensitivity to of epsilon to how how you know sensitivity of epsilon to how often do you pick the best arm? So when you kind of have a heavy weight on exploration, then you will pick the best arm very less frequently. Uh, so not frequently, but very less probability. Okay. Because with <coughs> one minus epsilon probability, you pick the best arm. So let's say best arm is 0.9. With one minus epsilon, which is one minus 0.5, with 0.5 probability, you pick this guy. It's a little bit higher than 0.5 because in the other side also you can potentially pick uh, this arm with uh, one by k probability, one by five probability. So essentially, that's what's happening. Is that is it clear, or is it, are you guys lost? <laughs> This is just, uh, you know, point 0.1 is a red curve and point 0.5 is a this curve. It's just saying this has higher exploration. So because I've said epsilon to be point 0.5, even if I know what the best arm is, I'm not kind of improving the curve anymore because uh, I have a high weight on exploring, keep exploring, okay. and exploration also. Exploration just means that with uniform probability, I pick one of the arms in the previous uh, s two slides ago. So let's say the best arm is 0.9. So, but because the is 0.9, I'm only picking that arm 
with 50 persons on every time. So I'm, I'm leaving money on the table, essentially. <laughs> What is it? E is the parameter of the algorithm. You just fix E in this algorithm. You can maybe try to learn it. That's a different problem. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, go over the next algorithm. <laughs> Okay, so let's resume. So we'll look at the second algorithm. Uh, it's called the upper confidence bound algorithm, or UCB. Doesn't stand for University of California Berkeley. So, uh, so UCB was an algorithm which was developed in 2002. So it's 16 years old now. Um, so. So this is again a strategy. What what it has to do is to is to somehow remember what it has done over the past, like whatever the rewards have collected over the past t minus one interactions with the users, and then take a clever strategy, clever action now, right? Uh, it I I choose I need to pick it, and uh, this strategy what it does is again it maintains uh, uh, similar to the epsilon greedy. It's going to maintain these uh, mu hat k comma s. So what is mu hat k comma s? Okay. Uh, let's just focus on this and forget about you know remaining symbols. What is mu hat k comma s? Okay. So mu hat k comma s is just saying um, for the kth arm, okay, at time s, what is the reward that I have collected for the kth arm? Some of you know average reward that I have collected for the kth arm. So, what is S? So, let's say, okay, let me actually draw you an example. So, think of the same website, three websites, right? K is equal to three, capital K is equal to three. Let's say mu, so, so let's say x to one. Uh, okay, let me actually not even put in the same. Okay, so let's say x one one. In the sense, in the first round, I tried, uh, I don't even need double index. So x1. So let's say I, in the first round I showed website one. So I got I got some reward x1. Okay. Um, yeah. Let me not even use x1, z1 because I don't want to confuse you with uh, the same notation here. So let's say I got some reward z1. We'll map it back to the original thing. Um, maybe in the next round I showed uh, second website. I got z2. Maybe in the third round I showed third website. I got z3. Right. And in the next round, maybe I showed uh, the second website again. Maybe I got Z4. Okay. And maybe in the fourth round, uh, or you know, fifth round, I again showed uh, the third website, Z5. Okay. For the fifth guy, I showed the same website, second website. Okay. In a sense, here, uh, all I'm trying to show, say is that here I've not shown anything. Here I've not shown anything. For this guy, in four rounds, I did not show anything. Here I did not show anything. Right. So basically, I didn't show. So. So this S just means the uh, number of times I've shown that for the arm. Okay. Although five five time instances have elapsed, my S is going to be three for this arm, one for this guy, one for this guy. That's all. All I'm saying is whenever you showed the arm, what was the reward you collected, and take the average. Simpler, simpler way to say that. Okay. So that's that's mu hat of k comma s. K is just saying the index of the arm. So first website, second website, third website. As it just represents, you know, maybe you are in time t actually. We are actually in time t, but I might have only shown that website three times, you know, which may be less than t. <coughs> if only if I have shown the same website t, you know, t minus one times, then s would be t minus one. Otherwise, s is some smaller number. Okay. That's all. Okay. So first, you compute mu hat k comma s. Okay. In fact, mu hat k comma s is what you had used in epsilon greedy. Okay. Mu, so at any time t, you just look at what is my best arm so far. You know, one of the arms will have a higher higher mu hat, 
which just means empirical average and that arm is my greedy arm you know if i'm supposed to be greedy i'll just play that arm okay well, that's what i was doing in the with 1 minus epsilon probability in the greedy setting okay now what is the twist with upper confidence bound i'm going to explain the name uh, in a few minutes uh, so what i'm going to do is i still want to make a decision based on this empirical averages of what's happened with each of the website versions before but i'm going to add an offset to this number and create a new number. So I had the empirical average. I'm going to create a new number using the empirical average, but in a, by adding an offset, which doesn't depend on data. It only depends on, you know, some weird transformation, but it only depends on what is the current time index and how many times have I shown this arm before. So for example, for Z3, S is one. Okay, so denominator is smaller. For Z2, S is 3, the number is a little bit bigger. Which means that this additional time that I'm adding for the third hour, sorry, for the third version of the website is going to be bigger than the additional time that I'm adding for the second version of the website. Because here I have this you know, bigger number. So this is a number which just depends on, it just counts. The number of times I've shown this particular website version and also in the numerator is the number of interactions that I've had with the, with the user so far. Okay. So that's the, so I'll create these new numbers. Okay. And then, once I get these numbers, I just use, a, use numbers at any given, at any given time uh, t, I need to make a decision, right? IT is what I need to decide, which, uh, which website is shown. I'm gonna take these numbers, there's gonna be one, uh, there's gonna be one per uh, arm, right? I'm gonna, have, which means I'm going to have k numbers. I'm just going to take that arm which has the highest number. That's all this means. Okay. Uh, this t subscript k t minus one is just a, you know forget about this. It's just because different different uh, uh, what is it called? different arms have different s's. So that's why there's some additional notation. But don't worry about this notation. Other thing is you had the original empirical means. You added some bonus. Or uh, some some offset, and then you're just taking the argmax of these modified numbers. Okay, whatever arm has the highest modified number, that's the arm you're gonna play. As in, that's the decision that you're gonna make in this round. That's it. That's the strategy. So this is not a randomized algorithm. This is basically deterministically, deterministically picking something uh, from your estimates. Right? This is a, these are what you've done in the past, how you've fared in the past. It's just adding some offset and ensuring I'm, I'm just taking an arm the, for now, to play now. So there's no randomization like this epsilon contrast into this. But uh, why, does, uh, why does this uh, strategy make sense? It makes sense because it's basically trying to balance two things, okay. One is this greediness that of course I'm gonna take the arm which has the highest current mean reward. But I'm also gonna give a bonus to those arms where I've not explored enough. Okay. Which means that if S is really small, I've not really tried Z1 and Z3 much, I'm gonna add an offset to them so that it counters that counters the fact uh, that it could counter the fact that this was this had a low value. Okay, if these guys are low but since I did not explore them, I'm gonna give them some bonus. Okay. So that that number eventually uh, may be higher than this guy. So this guy bonus may be pretty small. But these guys bonus may be larger. Okay. So this term is somehow acting, ensuring that you explore. So that's all that's all that. Is the intuition clear? And so it will always be the case that let's say you really understand, you really know the true mean values of every every um, okay still the bonus will always be there and so you'll keep switching from one to the other <laughs> the moment you're not exploring that you know um, too much okay. this bonus term will can keep on increasing because it depends on t so more number of rounds the numerator is increasing and the lesser you explore that guy compared to others their bonus will be higher 
and so you will definitely try that arm every you know sometime in the future so it's a similar kind of um, consequence similar to epsilon greedy in epsilon greedy you are actually picking uh, uh, arm at random here every arm will eventually will be tried okay. not eventually but every arm will be tried pretty much often you know over a long period of time yeah so in terms of math here uh, so for example Yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to, you know, substitute this in that and these are z. So z1 yeah. would be x11. So so you can so let's here there are three examples. Z2 would be x21, z4 would be x22, and z5 would be x23. And then you get so these three numbers are so s would be three here for z2. So for the second website version, k would be two. S would be three, and these are the x x two one, x two two, x two three. Okay, so again, it's an, uh, it's an experiment where uh, the ten actions. So previous example had five five arms, right? Here the ten actions. There are million interactions, actually quite a few. Right? This is the question is is this realistic? Uh, and the reward for each action has a mean of 0.5 divided by k. Uh, I think it is uh, I'm not I don't remember if it's Bernoulli or not. Uh, Bernoulli or Winform. Whatever. So there's a mean, mu k, mu one, mu two, mu three, mu k. Okay. And uh, and this is the cumulative regret that I'm plotting. This is regret, which is you want to collect more rewards, and regret is something minus rewards, total rewards. So you want to ensure that this blue curve is as close to zero as possible. That's what the algorithm is supposed to do. Okay. Cumulative regret means that you are adding, you know, you should collect more and more rewards. So cumulative regret should ideally flatten out, but it will not flatten out. But it's you know as long as it's things, it has a trend which is not linear with the number of rounds. It's it's a good enough strategy. Okay. I mean, of course, the bet better the strategy, the lower this curve is going. And this green curve is just uh, some theoretical analysis that people have done of how this expected cumulative regret uh, scales as a, as a function of uh, the number of arms and the number of rounds. And this little c hides the information about the mean rewards of each of the arms. So people have proved that this is the best. You know, this is a you know this algorithm comes with a guarantee that it will it will never have expected cumulative regret worse than this scale. So as time increases, you you really have a logarithmic type. Uh, C is a number which depends on the, the mu one, mu two, mu k. So the actual numbers in the problem instance, true mean rewards depends on that. So that's why this one is C. So here I'm just showing the dependence on the number of arms and the number of rounds. So anyway, I mean, in the experiment itself, this is, this is the experiment really, is that, that the cumulative regret is small, or the total reward collected is like really, is a flipped, flipped version of that. Okay. Okay, so that's using <coughs> the algorithm. So now again, we're gonna look at a different algorithm called Thomson sampling. And the reason why I brought this up is because I think uh, there was a Dirichlet distribution in LDA. Okay, there's going to be a Dirichlet distribution here as well. So let's revisit that Dirichlet distribution again. Okay, so LDA was. Uh, I hope everybody remembers what LDA is. Okay, so so Thomson sampling. So this is actually a very popular algorithm as well to for bandits. Uh, it's a Bayesian algorithm, which means that it's going to maintain posterior distributions. Uh, Posterior distributions per arm. Okay, so what what would what type of posterior distributions would an algorithm maintain? It's going to be just a posterior distribution of what it believes to be the true mean reward of that arm. Okay, you don't know the true mean reward. You're looking at some observation. Given the data, tell me what is the probability that the true mean reward is something or something else or something else or something else. That's that's the belief that you maintain, and that's the posterior distribution. So, so this is a, this is a really old strategy, but of course rediscovered and so on. Uh, so what is the strategy? You first assume that 
you don't know what the main rewards are, new eyes. So let's assume it's it's. So you don't have a belief on what the main reward could be. So you'll assume a uniform distribution. Okay, that's your prior. That the main reward is a, is is a is distributed uniformly. Okay, now the rewards main rewards themselves are not uh, uh, fixed unknown numbers. They are from your perspective, they are essentially uh, random variables. Because you're maintaining a belief on belief over there. So that's fine. So start with the belief that you don't know what the main reward is, but anyhow. Then uh, let at time, so let's say t rounds pass. Let's talk about what happens at the t round. Okay. Uh, like t minus 1 rounds pass, and uh, you compute some quantity called pi of i, comma t. Okay. Now what is pi of i, comma t? So that's going to be an uh, object associated with each arm. And that object is going to be precisely the posterior distribution of what you believe the mean reward should be uh, for the i term and the t term. So, <coughs> so in the previous algorithms, you were just maintaining empirical averages, that mu hat, something, something. Here, you're maintaining a distribution of what that true mean reward could be. Okay. You're maintaining a distribution of what mean reward could be. And then if you have a distribution, you can take a mean of that. And maybe that's your one number per arm. But here, we're actually not keeping one number per arm. We are maintaining a distribution per arm. That's pi i t. Okay. If you could maintain this object, which is a posterior distribution, then at you know maybe at you know using data up to t minus one, you somehow maintain this object pi i t per per arm i is equal to one to k. Then what you do is you you sample because it's a distribution, you can sample a number right at the tth period. From pi i t, get a number. Okay. Posterior distribution, but we know that it's a you know I am assuming mean rewards are between zero comma one. It's a distribution between zero comma one. I sample a number. It's going to be a number between zero comma one. I get one number per arm, so I get k numbers. Just play the arm which has the highest realized number. That's the algorithm. That's the algorithm. It's just saying maintain posterior distributions over arms. Given one posterior distribution, so in the running example, there were three websites, one posterior distribution per website, right? One uh, distribution like this, one uh, some, something like this, maybe one other one is flat. All are between zero to one, okay, zero to one. Okay, for the website one, website two, website three. Okay, so so maybe this is a uniform distribution, maybe some other distribution, maybe some other distribution. So you draw a number from each of these uh, distributions. Compare the numbers with each other and pick that arm which has the highest number. That's the algorithm. Okay. Is there any question about the algorithm? Okay. So So how do we maintain this posterior distribution? So that's the, uh, I guess, uh, tricky part. Um, so maintaining posterior distributions is easy if you can do base rule easily. Okay. So, 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 um, is the next picture better? Oh, oh that's just bad. So now I'm going to describe the next three slides, uh, how to maintain a posterior distribution. And that's going to uh, capture a property called the conjugate prior property. Okay. Have you heard of, have any of you heard of ca conjugate prior property? No. Uh, okay. So it's just a fancy name. It just means that uh, I'm going to do base rule very computationally efficiently. Okay. So how do we do that? Um, so think of a, Think of forget you know think of a parametric family of distributions parameterized by alpha. Okay. So think of all Bernoullis basically. Uh, no, think of all uh, beta distributions. Okay. I don't know if you remember what beta distribution is, but think of some set of distributions. Okay, they're all of the same type. You know, basically indexed by some number. As long as the parameter changes, it's a different distribution. Right? Think of all beta distributions. Okay, this set of distributions. With different potentially different parameters, different distributions, is said to be conjugate 
to a model, which is another distribution. Okay. Um, so the set of distributions have to be conjugate to a model or specifically a distribution. Okay. If the posterior distribution of your parameter given the data, this posterior distribution, okay, there is some Abi formula compared to the Abi formula, there is a posterior distribution, right? I mean, this is just base rule. Prior on your, para prior on your parameter theta, probability of uh, data given theta, you know, that's this. Numerator and integration. The denominator is just a denominator based rule. So anyway, you have a posterior distribution of your of your parameter. Theta is a parameter. <coughs> yeah. uh, sorry, posterior distribution of the variable. This posterior distribution also belongs to the set of is also beta. So what I'm saying is, you started with a beta distribution as your prior. Okay. You did some multiplication with likelihood and used base rule. The next distribution that you come on the right, you get on the right left hand side is also beta. So you started with beta did some base rule, got another distribution to the left hand side, that's also beta. Okay. That's what's meant by conjugate prior. So beta is conjugate to some model. If I start with a beta, do base rule, I get a beta, beta distribution mode, for example. Okay. So actually, uh, let me concretely specify what distribution is. We are going to look at Thompson sampling. Um, so for us in Thompson sampling, there's going to be a distribution. distribution. So, which means that our, our variable is going to be theta, similar to, similar to the previous slide. And it will have parameters alpha. So this is, our, this is going to be our uh, set of distribution. For different different alpha, there's going to be different different distribution. Okay. Um, so, if you remember from LDA, uh, if you draw a sample from a digital distribution, that's actually a probability mass function, which is like, a, which is essentially sums to one, for example. So, it's a, it's a PMF. Because you know the sum of the coordinates is equal to one. That's the that's the specialty of that Dirichlet distribution. Anyway, you start with the Dirichlet distribution. Uh, you don't need all this information. Okay. Actually, how does the Dirichlet distribution look like? This is how it looks like. So for different different alpha, the the four different alphas, I'm showing you the Dirichlet distribution for three dimension situation. Okay. In three dimensions, as in you're looking at three three support PMF. Okay. Point three, point three, point five. Sorry. 0.3.3.4. Yeah. So the support is going to be some sort of a space in three dimensions. In fact, it's going to be some sort of a triangular plane over which this is the PMF on top. Okay. This is the distribution PMF. From here, if you draw, draw a theta, that's going to be a number. That's going to be a number. So that's going to be a vector, three dimensional vector on, on this plane, on this support. So I start it's a PMF. It sums some, some, some to one. Okay, that's what a digital distribution is. Any questions about digital distribution first? Okay. Um, okay. So this digital distribution is conjugate to the categorical distribution or the multinomial distribution. It's the same thing. What is the categorical distribution? It's again a PMF. Think of it this way. I have three outcomes. Then I have to have a, let's say I have a category distribution which says first outcome happens with point probability point 0.2, second outcome happens with probability point 0.4, third outcome happens with probability point 0.4, then that's a category distribution. And we are saying that the digital distribution is conjugate to the category distribution. What does it mean? So let's say Z is a, Z is a multinomial or a categorical random variable, which means that it, it, it has this parameter, three numbers, let's say. It just says, Z takes a first outcome with probability theta 1, Z takes second outcome with probability theta 2, and so on. Right? And so the distribution is essentially is given this PMF, probability of Z is going to be just uh, theta to the power ZK, okay? Z being 1 or 0, the K <coughs> outcome being 1 or 0. Okay? That's the multinomial. This is the definition of the multinomial distribution. Okay? And uh, this is the definition of digital distribution. There was some uh, you know, long unwieldy formula in the previous slide. Ultimately, it's saying that proportional to something uh, to the power parameters minus one or something. Okay, it's a product of something. Yeah, also it's a product of something. Uh, what I want to kind of focus on is the, is this fact. We want to focus on this posterior. P of theta given, let's say observe n conjugate, sorry, n, uh, n values of the 
n values of the categorical distribution, let's say, or the multinomial. So the conditional probability is just going to be, you know, by base rule, this is the definition of base rule. Probability of a given b is probability of b given a times probability of a divided by probability b, right? That's base rule. And if you just plug in these expressions, you'll see that you'll have another product, you know, you can see that it's, you know, there's a bunch of products. So you'll also get a product like this, okay, over theta. And this is also Dirichlet. In the sense, this probability, I started with a Dirichlet. This was Dirichlet distributed, okay. I used specifically a particular distribution which is categorical or multinomial as a likelihood model. And the posterior distribution is also Dirichlet. If these are both Dirichlet distributions, then my, I, I don't really have to think of representing a distribution. I have so this will have parameters alpha. The prior will have parameters alpha. So this is the prior. It will have parameter alpha. This is the posterior. It will have a parameter alpha prime, and that alpha prime is nothing but uh, alpha plus some observations. You know, some of some observations minus one. So. In a sense, all you're maintaining is the parameters and you're updating the parameters. You're really not doing any integration, any base rule computation. Okay, that's the uh, advantage of thinking of conjugate priors. Okay. Uh, so why did we need conjugate prior? Is just to say that this guy, if you assume Bernoulli distributed uh, rewards, if you assume that mu's the rewards, the distribution of rewards for each arm is Bernoulli, and if you maintain a prior which is like uh, Dirichlet, oh sorry, Dirichlet in two-dimensional case is just a beta distribution. Okay. So what I'm saying is you can update parameters of this distribution without doing any humanness computation. That's all. Um, okay. Anyway, uh, if you understood the definition of conjugacy with Dirichlet and multinomial, it's good enough. Okay. So anyway, so. That was the only thing I wanted to address there. So that's Thompson sampling. I'm not showing any performance uh, plot of any, with any synthetic data, but it's going to be similar. It has the same performance upper bound or same performance guarantee in terms of theory uh, as the UCB algorithm. So it works. Um, so given the next uh, 30 minutes, I'm going to skip one more algorithm. So these are all strategies, right? I mean, so we saw epsilon greedy, we saw UCP, and we saw Thomson sampling. Thomson sampling, we just saw that we need to maintain posterior, we need to sample numbers, and we compare. Uh, I didn't really get into why it really, really works. Um, but you can, again, think of in terms of distribution. If the distribution is too flat, then you'll get a sample which is higher than the other numbers, and you somehow uh, explore. Okay, the whole point is epsilon greedy was a force exploration. With epsilon probability, you do explore, try other arms. With UCB and uh, Thomson, because you're adding bonus in the UCB case, and in Thomson you're maintaining a posterior distribution, uh, these naturally give you some exploration of other arms uh, compared to your greedy you know, compared to your best arm so far. Okay, something like that. Um, there's another algorithm which uh, works without assuming anything about uh, now removing the whole notion of probability. That when you try an arm. You're not getting a probabilistic reward anymore. Okay, you are. Somebody decides how to give you rewards. Okay, maybe there's a deterministic process, or maybe there are uh, some unknown numbers are there. You don't know this. It's, this is not a probabilistic thing. Okay, still you can have an algorithm which which kind of figures out which is the best version to show, in a non without making any probabilistic assumptions. Okay, uh, but we'll skip that. Uh, and we'll get to bandwidth with context because that's the more interesting, that's a more realistic setting. Okay, so, so far we have seen, I just had three websites to show and I was just trying to show as nicely as, as quickly as possible to figure out what is the best thing to show, right? Uh, but in, in reality, the problem is more nuanced where, where a user comes with a user profile, right? Uh, they're browsing history, there's some information about them, maybe they have an account and you know what they've done with the website or something. So. Given the context, you want to now show the best things, or you want to show the best uh, website or best service enhancement or whatever you care about, right? So that's what that's the problem we're going to look at, and 
so 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 what's changing from the previous a b testing and uh, multi on bandwidth setting is the is this user arrives with information so this arrives with information is the important part which is not there which was kind of completely ignored before right um okay <coughs> So there's no, there was no contest before, and that's what we're going to address today in the next half an hour. And uh, in the next couple of classes, we're going to address the second part, which is that there can potentially be carryover effects from one interaction to the other. Maybe it's the same user, this flipping pages on your website. So going from one page to the other to the other page, there's a consequence. Maybe you showed on the first page all sports-related articles. Therefore, in the next page, the event is only only going to be sports-related articles. So. So there's a long-term consequence of your actions, okay, or the decisions that you that you um, that you take, okay. So that's going to be part of reinforcement learning. I'm going to come back to this point towards the end as well. Uh, so let's only address this part. You know, try to bring in context while taking decisions, okay. Um, so in every round, we get a context, okay, and we want to find now the uh, best action to take. So it's not clear, right? So given a context, I need to take an action. So for every different context, there's gonna be potentially a different action. So essentially we really want is a mapping from features to actions. It's like uh, we are kind of going back to supervised learning type of setting where we want a mapping from inputs to outputs, right? Here the outputs are actually actions. We are just calling them actions. So we want actually a function from context to uh, actions, okay? Which basically tells you what to do in each context. Maybe the user profile is a working professional, uh, you know, show uh, you know, something, maybe uh, uh, music or books, and if user profile is something else, then do so, show something else, right? And uh, also you need to take into account that so you may not see the same context twice, you know? A working professional who has visited your website three times and you know, has these, all these other properties, you may never see that again, okay? So and that's also potential, potentially potential aspect here. And uh, so let's see how we address this, con how, how do we wrap this context into the, our picture? So, so for that, so why is, so first of all, with context, I have to really look at functions, which map from context to actions. Those are more complicated things than just saying which arm is the, which action is the best directly, okay? So to bring out what is the, how do you deal with this issue of, you know, now you're trying to figure out functions how many different functions there could be for which you need to figure out the best function, which is a mapping from context to action, there is, it's gonna be a complicated problem. So let's see how context can help us uh, manage this uh, um, finding a function issue in a better way, okay? So let's look at an example first. So let's say we have uh, five ads, okay, A1 to A5, okay? And let's say, for simplicity, let's say we have four policies, in the sense, there are four uh, functions which would say, if this is a profile, show this ad. If this is a profile, show this ad, okay? So there are four different such rule sets, or uh, four different such uh, uh, business rules or something like that, or mappings, basically, from context to actions, okay? So I skipped exp3 algorithm, but it works very similar to UCB and Thompson, so I'm gonna kind of uh, hand wave a little bit here. So for, for a bandit algorithm, exp3 is a bandit algorithm, it is as if it has four arms, you know, it has four policies, you just need to figure out which policy is the best policy. Policy is, uh, again, I repeat, policy is just a, uh, is a map from context to actions. Okay. Map just means a function. So you can think of a bandit problem where instead of pulling, taking an action, you're saying, I want to try a policy. There's a difference here. You're trying a policy rather than an action. Uh, but how do you get back to the action switch? Because ultimately I want to show an ad. You know, even if I take a policy, uh, I, I need to show an ad, and that's fairly kind of straightforward, which is that, let's say the I have four policies, E1, E2, E3, E4, these are policies. I have four policies. My bandit algorithm is gonna pull, is gonna choose a policy, okay, somehow. Uh, maybe using the UCP type of thing and so on. It's gonna pull a policy. The policy will suggest some action, right? Policy sees a context, the same context, all the policies see the same context, they all say some, so take some action, which is show this ad, this ad, this ad, this ad. So for example, first policy E1 says show ad two, okay? 
second policy e2 is, is also saying show add 2 and the third and fourth policies are saying show add 4 four times Uh, so, so say exp3 uh, so, or a particular bandit algorithm, so MAB algorithm, chose let's say the first policy, okay, because it can only choose policy. So let's say it chose the first policy, okay. Um, this algorithm, uh, you know, by sampling from base is not very important. It says it chose the first policy, okay. Like UCB can choose first policy, x can choose from first policy, let's say. And say the first policy action is A2. This is what I wrote here. Okay. So you show that add, and let's say you show that add, and that add is actually clicked. Okay. Let's say that's the situation now. Um, So what uh, this particular bandit algorithm exp3 it does? Okay, let's see. Maybe. So what this bandit algorithm will do is, it's going to say I showed, uh, you know, we sh we pull the arm e1. This is that e1 policy. It said show add a2, and that add was actually clicked. So I need to get some reward for that, right? Let's say clicking the add is a positive reward. So because the add was clicked, I'm going to derive some reward. It's just called, I mean, in this notation, it's called like still S, but don't worry about it. Um, so I, I get a reward for the policy and all the other arms, which are also policies, I'll set a reward of zero. Okay. So this algorithm, uh, the way it works is it kind of updates numbers for all the arms that it, it has, this particular algorithm. Okay. Um, so this algorithm adds a reward to the arm that got the reward. I mean, because I played that arm. And all the other arms, I'm, I'm going to set it to zero. That's 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 the uh, numbers that it kind of tags on to whatever estimate that it has. Okay. And uh, at this point, you know, this is a bandit algorithm, so it really doesn't know anything about context. It's it's trying, it's picking policies, it's choosing among policies, right? It's uh, four policies. And the question is, can we do better? Because the second policy also suggested that. Add A2. Okay. First policy suggested A2. Second policy also suggests A2. Because my algorithm, bandit algorithm said take uh, first policy recommendation, or said take first policy, uh, I only add the reward for the first policy. Okay. And set the rewards for all the other policies to zero. So I'm, I'm saying that because multiple policies can say the same action, and that action yielded a reward, you should actually backtrack and include the, you know, get back the say that even the second policy also got a reward. Okay. That's the uh, idea. Uh, we should better estimate the reward of E2 uh, than to set the reward of uh, second policy or second arm to be zero. Okay. That's uh, the key idea here. Okay, so that's the idea. So let me actually just uh, mention the algorithm. So, okay. If you did not get the previous couple of slides, just think of it this way, right? What we are trying to build is an algorithm which works with context, right? Now, if you want to work with context, you have to work with uh, functions which are going to map from context to actions, okay? It's not the same case as before where it was only trying a particular actions, okay? So the case here is you have to really come up with uh, uh, maps from context to actions, okay? So let's say we have uh, capital Pi number of uh, policies. Or capital Pi, this is the number of, not the number, but this is the set of all policies, which just means maps from context to actions. Okay? So in the previous example, there were four you know, uh, you know, there were four, four policies, four in previous example. Okay, there are four policies. Okay. What I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna maintain a number per policy, similar to uh, 
Planet algorithms, planet algorithms. Think of uh, UCB or uh, Epsilon Radii. Mm -hmm. That's some new hat K commands, right? Similarly, I'm going to maintain a number per policy. Okay, I'll start with one, some default numbers. All of them have the same number, so it's it's not like one policy is better than another. Okay. In each round, in each round, I'm going to observe a reward. Of course, to observe a reward, I have to uh, start with some policy. Let's say I. Um, So for me now xt is going to be a reward okay uh, xt is going to be a reward <coughs> okay, let's actually skip the observe xt part because first i'm going to define how to get uh, how to how to pick a policy that's the whole point of the algorithm how to pick a policy and the policy will tell you how to react to the context uh, sorry how to uh, which action to pick given the context, right? So the way I'm going to do it is uh, as follows. So I have I have these numbers for each policy, right? I'm going to look I'm going to look at. So let's say I observe the reward xt. So I'm going from xt to xt plus one. Okay. So let's say I observe the reward xt. I I played something. I got an xt reward. I played an action and and, uh, and got a reward. For each policy, I'm going to say. Did the policy say that I should play action A? For each action A, did the policy say that I should uh, play action A or not? Oh, actually, I apologize. Okay, so I sorry backtracking. So this is actually context. Sorry, I forgot about the notation. So XT is the context. I have been given context. Okay, user profile. Given the user profile, for each action that I can take, ultimately all policies will take some actions. So the all the actions that I can possibly take is these these five ads that I can show in the previous example. Right? For each policy, I'm gonna look at no, not for each policy. For each action A that I can take for this context, I'm gonna look at the sum of all the policies that are recommending action A. Okay. If if there is a if there is a policy which is recommending action A, take its weight. If there is some other policy which is not recommending action A, don't take its weight. So you just kind of aggregate all the policies weights or these these numbers that have assigned assigned to policies which recommend action A, okay, in the numerator. And the denominator is the sum of all these weights. Okay. At the beginning, if there are four policies, and the denominator is four. So what I'm trying to create, okay, so in step one, I'm just trying to create a distribution over actions that I should be taking given this current context xt. So context, somebody gave me the context xt, I need to take actions, five actions, five ads that I was supposed to show. I'm trying to create a distribution over these ads. Okay. Once I can create a distribution over these ads, which is this uh, this object, I can sample from the distribution and play that ad. Okay. If I, if I sample, let's say this distribution is gonna be five, you know, support five. Because in the ad there was, uh, you know, in the previous example there was five ads, so it's a PMF with five values, right? Once I can create this object, I just have a sample from it. It'll say, take action three or action four or action five, and then or one and two, whatever, and then I'm gonna take that action. That's it. So the, that's the strategy of this algorithm. Okay. This algorithm is maintaining weights for policy, somehow going from policy weights to some sort of a distribution of actions. This is the distribution of actions. And once I get the distribution of actions, I'm just play, you know sampling from that, get an action, and play. That's what's happening with exp4. Um, because I skipped exp3, maybe it seems like a out of the blue different uh, strategy, but the strategy is quite straightforward. You know, given, given policies, maintain a, create a distribution of actions, and play, that, play, play from that uh, distribution of actions. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. So the exploration is given by adding some terms. Okay, so add some offset. So okay, this is not really exploration. So uh, do some, you know, you're computing numbers. Do a shifted computation of the numbers. This is, this is a essentially a constant, but uh, do some shifted computation of numbers. 
but to get to uh, oh yeah sorry so because this is shifted there's going to be a distribution which is this is never going to have any no action will have p of a0 so you are exploring here because no action will have p of a0 because i'm adding a number here offset is that clear and there's some i mean he, okay just think of it as some constant point or one or something some, it depends on the number of policies and the uh, number of actions and number of counts and stuff. But don't worry about it, just think of it as point one. Um, so that's what's promoting exploration. But the whole point is we are maintaining, uh, maintaining numbers over policies, but we are somehow collapsing those numbers into numbers over actions. That's what's happening. Numbers over policies to numbers over actions. Okay. And once you get numbers over actions, we get sampling from that. And what I've not told you yet is, okay, we sample from that, we play your action, the action gave us a reward, the reward I've not written here, this is the, sorry, this is the, this is the context. So the action gives, gives us a reward, let's call it RT, okay. R for reward. Now I have to say, with RT, how do I update these weights? That's the only thing left. Right? I maintain weights, from weights I went to weights on actions, or from distribution on actions, drew an action, AT, and observe reward RT. From rewards, I need to now somehow tell you how to get to WT plus one of pi for each pi. If I do that, then I have a complete algorithm which maintains numbers, kind of keeps changing the numbers based on which policy is good, okay, because of this exploration business. Um, yeah, that's what's happening. Any questions? Yeah, and the update is going to be, um, it looks like, and the reason why it's called EXP4, 4 because there's context. If there was no context, the previous algorithm was called EXP3. And a much better setting was called EXP2. So there was some naming convention that they followed. So that's why it's EXP4. And why EXP? I guess EXP because there's a exponent, exponential, you know, multiplicative update on the weights that is maintaining. So that's why it's so <laughs> maybe convention apart, uh, the way you're gonna once you get a reward, how you're gonna update is just uh, some rescale version of the reward. Uh, you add, you kind of multiply with the current weight to get the new weight. Otherwise, you keep retain the same weight as before. I mean, you update weights for those policies. The policies which recommended AT as the action. So maybe AT as action in the previous case was recommended by two policies, E1 and E2. So you update the weight for both E1 and V2 as this guy, and retains um, the, the weights as before for the E3 e If you run this algorithm, uh, I don't think I've run this algorithm, but uh, if you run this algorithm, it also has a really good guarantee in terms of maximizing rewards and minimizing cumulative effect. That is the, okay. Any questions? Uh, we started with all ones, right? I mean, you, see, you can just start with some numbers where, where you're not preferring one policy over the other because you don't know which policy is better. Okay. Uh, what is, I guess, uh, put, pushed under the rug is uh, why do you have to maintain a weight per policy? If you have five contexts, and f uh, sorry, how many contexts were there? Uh, so here, in the previous example, I had four policies fixed policy. So uh, I need to just maintain four numbers. But if I had context, okay, um, if I can count context, so let's say I had uh, 32 context, okay. And um, for each context, context, I need to uh, take, uh, let's say, um, four different actions, four actions. I can potentially take four different actions, okay. So I want a function which maps from a context to an action. I have 32 choices for the input, and four choices for the output. So how many functions are there? Thirty-two functions? Uh, it's 
4 to the power 32. Okay, the reason, okay, I'll tell you why there is a case. Because for the first context, you have four possible choices of actions. For the second context, you have four possible choices of actions. For the third context, you are just counting. So each policy essentially saying per context what is action. And there are four choices here, four choices here, four choices here, four choices here. So it's uh, four to the power 32 number of policies. That's probably a huge number. <laughs> okay. So that's why this algorithm is not scalable at all. So there are many different algorithms that people have proposed which are more complicated, which deal with this. Okay. So that's what I brushed under the rug. <laughs> uh, let's see. So, so let's get to, you know, let, let me end with uh, just motivating why this itself is also not enough. Is because, you know, so let's try to understand what we did today, right? We did A-B testing, but uh, don't worry about A-B testing because we want to have some dynamic, you know, we don't want to do, we really want to be online. So we need to react to feedback we're getting instantaneously per round rather than wait till, wait till some period of time and then do some decision between actions, between actions or arms or things like that. So, so actions led to rewards, right, in multi arm violence. Taking action led to reward, but there was no uh, context, right? There was no context. So there's our base objects were just actions. I just need to figure out which action is the best, which website is the best. Here, contextual matter, there's a state or a context, okay? I'm calling state and context. So I'm trying to decide, given a state or a context, what action I should take. That action, together with the context, will tell me what the reward is. Because you know, because let's say there's a user, the user is telling me what the state is, and the user is waiting here. What I'll show, I showed an action, maybe a website version. Based on my profile and the action that you took, I'm going to tell you what the reward is. Right. So the reward depends on both the state or context and the action. But still, there is no temporal relation between the action I took in one interaction with the user and uh, some other interaction with the user. There is no temporal relation. So this is not enough. When we want to have dependence across time, my action today or in this time period or this first web page has influence on subsequent rewards that I'm going to get. If if somebody is a, loves music and I show a, a page of all sports related articles, maybe they'll click the first page, uh, you know, it's from small problem. Next page will, will also be sports related content. Then further my reward is lower that they'll click on something. Further reward is lower that they click on something. So there's a con consequence of, you know, the initial action item of me showing just sports related articles for this mismatched state has a long term consequence of how I'm going to fare further down in the interaction with my portal. Okay. So what I mean by that, so, so what is changing from this picture to this picture is that if I take an action now, this dotted line represents that I may get a reward long time afterwards. Okay. I took an action now, after several other actions, there may be some reward and that reward could happen because of this action start, you know, because of this action, rather than the immediate action. Okay, there could be delayed reward. And also this, because I took this action, that influences the next interaction, that influences the next stage, that next uh, situation that I'll be in. Okay. Because I took action sports, the next situation I'm going to be in is a, is probably a disgruntled user and a sports related uh, page, okay, something like that. So the state of the user is going to influence the actions that I take, for example. So, so, so when I say that, I'm just saying that these. So in contextual bandits, from one round to the other, states are changing exogenously. Somebody else, like a user, is coming, uh, coming and telling me the state. Here, it's not exogenous. You taking an action is influencing who's coming next or what's the situation next. Okay. That's the uh, difference uh, with reinforcement learning. Uh, sorry, that's the difference with this setting. And for this setting, I mean. There is this reinforcement after, right? In the sense, actions have influences into what's going to happen in the next round and next round and so on. That's the reinforcement aspect. And in that, you learn. And, and and if you see, throughout this lecture, the learning was just to figure out what is the best action. We were really not thinking about parameters anymore, 
okay although we were maintaining parameters for example in ucb we were maintaining averages in thomson sampling we were maintaining posterior distributions but that was not the goal we wanted to really focus on these actions or the decisions and that's why the goal was to minimize or maximize re rewards or maximize rewards rather than learn the best parameter okay it's a very different objective than um supervised learning for example uh, so okay. To summarize, uh, we looked at A/B testing as a way to introduce uh, enhancements. Right? Uh, may need a lot of examples. Depends on depends on the power of the so number of examples influences the power of a hypothesis test. Okay. Um, and A/B testing is essentially based on the idea of randomized control trials. Okay. Where you randomly split your population into two groups so that they have similar statistical characteristics and show to one two groups or k groups or whatever show for each uh, you know split sample something uh, some control or treatment one treatment two treatment three uh, and then uh, get a average reward number and see whether that statistic is very different from some other sets so that's the hypothesis multi sample multi sample hypothesis two sample hypothesis and we also looked at two two new online problems where you are now focused on per interaction you want to improve your performance improve your decisions uh, what website to show what action to take that was multi arm bandits without context and contextual bandits. Okay. And contextual bandits are a special case of reinforcement. So when you assume that there is no long term consequence of my action, that's contextual bandits. But in the general setting, there could be long term consequence of your action. That's reinforcement bandits. Okay. And that's what we're going to look at uh, next uh, lecture. So, any questions at this point? Yeah. The yeah. Weights are just uh, which policy is uh, interesting or important. It's a it's a policy importance pa pa weight number. Importance yeah. meaning how good we currently how we think it is, right? Yeah, okay. because you can see that uh, uh, yeah, you can see that if let's say there's a policy with you know, let's extreme case. There's one policy with weight one, and all the other policies are zero. Then P of A is just uh, wherever the policy is saying, uh, you know, for every action A. So you know, there's only one policy, right, which has weight non-zero. So the denominator is just sum to one, right, in that example. And in the numerator, you can see that if the if you know there are some or all policies, but weights of all the all the policies are almost zero except for one policy. That policy's weight is one, and so the numerator is going to be equal to one only when that only when the policy with weight one has the action A. So P of A is going to be a degenerate distribution where P of A is equal to one, where that policy is saying the action should be A, and everywhere else is zero. So it's as good as saying if there's a policy with high weight, then I, I'm pretty much following that policy. Okay. You're pretty much following that policy's action. Um, okay, so uh, that's about it. There is a, I think uh, there's some sample questions and there's some additional examples um, in the appendix. You should go through it and definitely go through exp3 if you have time. Uh, I skipped it, but it's a very simple, I mean, very straightforward algorithm to understand. Given that we saw ex exploring greedy, UCB, and Thompson sampling. Okay, that's it for today.